here's what we're doing tonight. Uh, this week I've been taking you th like way back to the 1980s, home of the hair bands on cassette tapes, uh, spandex and VHS, horror movies and RPGs. That's right. We've been going over Tales from the Loop. And uh, last night, last night I walked you through how to create a character in the game Tales from the Loop. And I also showed you about the mechanics in the game. So if you missed it, you can go back and watch them by clicking on the videos um, over to the left-hand side if you're on PC, and you'll be able to find them there. Or you can go to my YouTube channel. If you just go to YouTube and search Logician Tim, you'll be able to find it there. So uh, like I said, tonight we're going to wrap up the uh, RPG book Tales from the Loop. And we're going to be talking about the mysteries in the game. And remember, uh, mysteries are what they call campaigns in other games. Okay, so... And there's two different types of mysteries that are in Tales from the Loop, okay, that we're going to be going over. So the first one is called a mystery landscape. And this is more of a sandbox style. Uh, it's very open world in nature. Uh, kids are able to move around, you know, from location to location freely. Uh, there's not a pre-written script or anything like that. Um, so they get to just kind of seek out mysteries and go where they want to and kind of follow wh whatever they want to. And... Uh, the, you know, this type of game, the, the game mode has no real limits and it can be played pretty much indefinitely until you, you, your team just kind of decides, all right, well, let's kill some people off or let's finish the mystery or whatever. So it's kind of neat that they add this and they add the framework to it as well. And it's very interesting uh, that they did that. Um, but the, the primary way to play is what's called the mystery story. Okay. And let me turn to page here. So the mystery story is the primary way to play, okay? And they add four of these inside of the game. And this is more of your traditional, uh, what I think would be traditional campaign style uh, mode where the narrative is given to you and it's given to you in uh, six phases that I'm gonna be going over. So it gives you these, these four different mysteries uh, in the book and uh, there's going to be six phases to each to each mystery, okay? And so it's good for your one-off or your shorter campaigns. Um, each each playthrough, they said, takes about two hours to play. Um, like I said, there's four mysteries included. Three of them are considered um, uh, like your 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 one-off, your standoff mysteries. But the last one, the fourth one, um, is considered to be like a grand finale, something that you don't do standalone, but you do it after you finished the other. The other three mysteries and it takes it said it'll take two to three sessions and if each session is two to three to four or five hours that's a lot of play time so i thought that was really cool that they they included this you know grand finale mystery inside of the game so that's pretty cool so um so when we're talking about the mysteries in um in tales from the loop what's up jay when we're talking about mysteries inside the tales of the loop they they give some some nice uh, guidelines for you to follow when you're when you're creating the mystery and when you're playing it. And so one of the first things that it tells you that we're going to do is uh, to determine what they call the truth of the mystery. And the truth of the mystery is um, is really what the story is about. You know what's the hook. You know what's the, what's the overarching plot. And uh, and they kind of break this down into into three basic categories, okay? And they give these for, for us, and they um, they do this uh, very nicely so that we can, we can see exactly what they're talking about here, okay? Here we are. The truth of the mystery. And they, they break them down into three different categories of either human error, conflicts, or mischief, okay? And so when you're developing your, story, your, your truth of the mystery, the overall story, you can, you can kind of choose from these three predetermined areas and it helps you, um, uh, helps you come up with some ideas, right? Um, so the first one is human error, which is about you know, people's inability to manage the awesome things that they've created, right? So uh, for example, a scientist you know, created a time machine but he's lost control of it. And um, you know, he's been thrown back into the stone age and there's a the whole and as a result there's a hole in the, the the fabric of time and space and creatures are wandering in and out and it's up to the kids to kind of figure out what's going on here and what they can do to solve this mystery or another example of human error would be uh, three different you know experimental buildings are 
you know, randomly creating a force field that makes everybody that comes in contact with it in this force field older. And again, it's up to the kids to solve this mystery. Uh, another example might be that uh, a scientist puts his brain into a robot. I like this one. Uh, a scientist puts his brain into a robot, but then the robot runs off and escapes and won't come back. That to me, just that's awesome. So that's, those, that's an example of human error uh, that you could pick from the, with the truth of the mystery. Another one would be considered conflicts, which like a conflict, uh, they describe it as a tension between uh, two, or, two or more people. That makes sense. But they want opposite things and they're willing to fight or do whatever it takes uh, to accomplish what they want. Okay. So, for example, it gives us uh, the Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union, you know, sends industrial spies over to steal the secrets of DARPA. Um, or a scientist tries uh, to use runaway kids as human tissue, uh, you know, human tissue samples for their cyborg factory or something like that. Uh, or a student hates their teacher and they're willing to, um, to take revenge by using all types of tech. So maybe they're hacking them and they're doing all these things. And it's up to the kids to, to decide, you know, to figure out what's going on and how to solve it. So I think these are, these are pretty neat. Um, the final one that they give us is mischief. And this is about, you know, the other kids who create problems, you know, just for fun. And we all know those mischievous, mischievous kids. I was, I was a little bit of one, I'll have to admit. And, um, uh, so an example of that might be, you know, a teenager might steal a robot and bring it to a party, but things go crazy and, you know, somebody's really hurt or even maybe killed. And so uh, now we've got to get in control of this robot. Or another example might be if a kid finds a gap in the ground or a hole in the ground and it leads down into a maze of underground tunnels where the kid gets lost and uh, you, you have to figure out what happened to the kid. You just know that they're lost and they, there was this hole in the ground. Uh, another sense of mischief might be if some teens used an invention, some type of invention to cheat on their test in some kind of creative and awesome way. So, uh, hey, I'm all for it. If you can figure it out, yeah, go for it. Um, so I think it's really neat, uh, you know, these examples that they give us what would be considered truth in the story of the mystery or the truth of the mystery. And, um, you know, it's the underlying story to what is going on, right? And then you have... Um, it tells us that there's mystery in, uh, there's, pardon me, there's mystery and there's everyday life, right? So you don't want to forget that there's, when you're, when you're telling the story as a GM, when you're playing it as a player, there's, there's always the mystery that's going on. And then there's your everyday life that's going on too. And so you're going to be playing out both scenes to help bring in, um, and, and, and fill out these roles of the world, right? So in everyday life, um, these type of scenes are going to be a little bit less than, than the mystery scenes, right? Because you're going to spend more time trying to figure out what's going on in the mystery and what, how to solve the mystery. Uh, but there are going to be some, some everyday life things going on. So uh, it gives an example of so when one scene, the kids are, are chasing a runaway robot. And in the next, they're, you know, they're trying to stop their, their dad from you know, driving drunk or something like that. Uh, and then some scenes can be, of course, you know, everyday life and part of the mystery as well. Um, but the everyday life scenes I thought were cool because it helps the players kind of get into the role of the kids that they're playing, right? It helps them really flesh that out. And um, yeah, so that's what I was, I was trying to read here because I, yeah, it'll be, it'll be developed. Okay, here's what I was trying to say. So the everyday life um, type stuff will be developed you know, help the kids develop their characters, help the people develop their characters as kids. And the GM is going to pull a lot of this information from the character sheet that the kids filled out. And so they're going to look at that and kind of figure out what is their day-to-day -day life like and also bring in those players to help them and have them, the players, describe what their everyday life is like as well. I thought that was cool. So um, let me see. There is an example here I wanted to get to. Where was it? Okay, so... Uh, and it talks about these everyday scenes that you could develop with or without trouble. Okay, so one of them might be um, without trouble might be, you know, everyday scenes. Um, uh, dad is sitting in the kitchen and he's got suit all over, all over his face and he speaks proudly of fighting a fire during the night. Uh, or your dad wants to throw Jacob's sneakers away and buy new ones. And maybe Jacob doesn't want new sneakers or maybe you're jealous that you didn't have get new shoes. 
Um, and so those would be some everyday scenes that you might play out as a, J, as a GM or as a player in the game. And then you can also have everyday, uh, everyday life scenes with trouble as well, of course. Right. So it might be that it's the middle of the night. Mom's disappeared into the forest in just her nightgown and dad is at work. And so you have to decide as a player, am I going to am I going to role play this um, this part of it? Am I going to call the police or am I going to call my friends? We're going to go looking for mom. Um, it could be Tony's waiting on the path to the beach with a baseball bat and a wide grin, a wide grin. What did Tony just do? Uh, what is he about to do? What does he have in his mind? And so these are types of everyday scenes that aren't necessarily part of this mystery that, you know, the, this robot's running wild somewhere, but is part of your everyday life of things that you still have to handle. So I thought that was pretty neat that they, they added all of that in there. So um, it talks about when it gives you these mysteries, like I said, they give you four of them. They talk about um, there's actually six phases to every mystery, okay? And you're just gonna walk through these as a GM. And it kind of helps you um, determine, you know, where you're at, okay? And so it says some GMs like to announce that they're moving to the next phase. Other GMs like to keep it vague. And so uh, they don't, you know, so that the players don't really know exactly where in the story that they're at, okay? So what they had, the six phases are introducing the kids, introducing the mystery, solving the mystery, the showdown, the aftermath, and then change, okay? Those are the six phases. And some of them are pretty self-explanatory. So the first one, first phase is going to be uh, introducing the kids. So each kid will get a, a real short scene of their own from everyday life, uh, either with or without trouble, that helps um, that helps you know, ground the, the player inside of, that, uh, in inside of that character, right? And then number two would be introducing the mystery. And so kids... Uh, will encounter or or discover something that they start to investigate. Okay, um, where did I see this? Oh, I did talk about some of this, right? Yeah, with with the kids in, in everyday trouble. Yeah, so I did talk about that. So um, so they might encounter or discover something that they start to investigate. The number three is solving the mystery, and so in this phase, the kids are going, and this is kind of the medius phase of the game, is, is kind of solving the mystery, right? So this is where most of the, your, your scenes are going to take place. So this is where the kids will visit locations, they'll discover clues, they'll overcome trouble, um, at the same time having to manage their everyday life. Maybe their mom is calling them back for uh, to eat supper or uh, they have a baseball game to get to, or maybe they got detention or something like that, but they had this mystery going on. And so that the kind of balance the two, but this is where the bulk of, of the game kind of takes place is in this solving the mystery phase. And then number four is the showdown. All right. So the kids, have, the kids have solved the mystery. They figured out what's going on and now they have to try to stop what's happening. And it's usually like with some big dramatic sh scene and this build up, right. Of uh, you finally got the robot uh, cornered and you're about to break in the door and figure out some, some plan to, to grab it and take it home, right? So that would be kind of like the showdown. You're going to face this this big foe, right? And then five is the aftermath. So the mystery's been solved. Uh, the kids are successful. Excuse me. Uh, their lives are mostly the same as they were before. Um, you know, each kid kind of gets their, their own kind of finish up scene at the end uh, of their everyday life. And so you return home, you, you've captured this robot, and you return home, and your mom's waiting for you to take out the trash and do your homework and, and whatever, whatever. And so you're going to go back to that. I'm going to kind of back to the beginning, right? And then finally, the last phase of the mystery is what they call the change. And um, this is where the players get a chance to change their kids, all right? So they can change. They can either add, hey, Scott, they can add... Um, they can add problems or they can reduce problems to their kids. They can add iconic items. And so let's say uh, my, my last iconic item was a, a cigarette lighter that I'm never without. But along the way, let's say I found some, um, I don't know, let's say I, I found some kind of awesome gun or something, right, uh, along the way. And I want that to be my iconic item now. And so you, you can change that between mysteries. Uh, you can change your prides or your relationships with the other players. And so let's say we weren't very good friends at the beginning of it. We become enemies by the end, or we could become friends. And all that's going to happen in this last phase of change. 
And then also this is where the GM would give um, the experience points to the to the kids to the players for um, you know for doing well when where they can then turn um, what was it five exp into one attribute point. Uh, remember, you still have a max of five attribute points uh, in any one um, one any one attribute, but um, you can get an extra one by spending five exp points, which you get at the end of the game. So that's pretty cool. So when you're going through, they give they give tons of information here about um, about creating your um, your mystery. You know, talking about the clues that you can put everywhere, and this is what I thought was cool. It's called where is it here? I thought I had my oh no I didn't wrong wrong page. <coughs> It's what they call the the mind map, okay? And so they got this 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 nice little little map for you where it has these different characters in here, okay? And it has their relationships to them. So Peter, um, he's a dream hacking teen, and he's scared of Mickey, his abusive father, who wants Annette, Peter's mother. Uh, I'm sorry, and who wants Anita uh, Annette back, okay? Peter feels abandoned by Annette. Annette's in a relationship with Nicholas, and it has this nice little map here just kind of built out for you um, that you can easily look at, you know, what the relationship is there. And so maybe you can build some tension on that or um, this Peter is a dream hacking teen. And so what does that mean? What's he doing there? And how can you relate? How can you pull that into the into the narrative? Right. Hey, Michael, what's going on, man? All right. We'll see you, Scott. Have fun at the movies. Um. So yeah, the, the, all these these little things that they add like this really help a GM uh, when it comes to comes time to make the mystery, right? These, these mind maps and stuff like that. It's just really cool. And um, so they had tons tons of information for you. Then I thought this was this was a nice addition too, and I'm sure they probably do this in other other books as well, where um, they have all types of vehicles and and robots and dinosaurs and and all types of things with little short, you know, pictures and little short descriptions listed in the book that you can, you know, kind of pull out and show to your players and say, oh, you're running up on this vector land train, you know, and you can, you can show them a picture of it. You can tell them about it. It's, you know, it's a modular design often used for civilian as well as military pr purposes. The land train can be customized with freight and service modules because of its shape. It has earned the nickname, the centipede. And so you can show them that instead of just, uh, trying to paint a picture uh, in in the head, you can actually uh, show show them a picture of it right here in the book. And I thought that was just that was just a nice touch. And they maybe they do this in other RPGs. Like I said, I'm I'm kind of a noob when it comes to that. But I thought it was a nice addition that they threw that in the book. So besides that, okay, they do talk about the mystery landscape, which I told you a little bit about before, and they give you some guidelines, uh, and they're very similar to the mystery stories where you have your hooks and your countdown um, and they give you a couple of very short almost like mini mysteries that you can go through and you can use parts of when you're going through the the sandbox version of the game or the what's called the mystery landscape version of the game so i don't want to tell you much about them because it will really spoil uh spoil the game for you and um you know, really, that's kind of the same as the rest of the book. Uh, from here on out, it's it's all mysteries, and they give you a bunch of mysteries. Like I said, they give you uh, three mysteries that take around two to five hours to play, and then they give you one grand finale uh, mystery that is that it says it takes like two to five sessions to play, or two to three sessions to play. So this is giant um, uh, grand finale that I thought you know is an awesome addition. I'd love to see what it is uh, is to play it. So, but that's about it. That's about all I'm gonna gonna share with you about Tales from the Loop uh, in this book, uh, because I do not want to want to spoil any of these awesome mysteries that they have in plan for you. But what I am gonna do is now I'm gonna switch over and kind of give it my my report card. Okay, uh, I did this with kids on bikes, and I'm gonna do this um, do it with Tales from the Loop as well. And so I'm just gonna quickly go over. Uh, the grades that I gave for Tales from the Loop. And 
Um, it really starts, you know, starts with the character creation, which I gave an eight out of 10. I really enjoyed the character creation. They broke it down into 16 steps, which seems like a lot, but they're very straightforward. Some of them are very simple. Um, it would, I think it would probably take you maybe 20 minutes, maybe 20 minutes uh, from, from scratch uh, to create a character. So I really like that. The customization, um, you know, I kind of dinged a little bit, I gave a six out of 10. Uh, I mean, yes, you can pick one of eight of the characters that they give you and you says you can even make your own, but I would like to have a little bit more customization available, you know, as the character progresses, maybe something like a, a skill tree, or, uh, if you're good at computers, then maybe you gain hacking, um, or you gain, I don't know, something else you, you gain mobile something, right? I, I would like to see a little bit more progression as your character, uh, gets older or, um, um, you know, gets refines a skill, right? So I did ding it just a little bit uh, there on customization. And then again, on progression, I dinged it a little bit because, uh, you know, your character can level up by by growing older and by, so you can gain a year and you'll actually gain an additional um, attribute point. At the same time, you lose a luck point. And so you're going to join, you're going to gain this attribute and you're going to lose a luck point. And it's really no different than simply starting your character one age older. And so if I was playing a 12 year old, well, I could just, I could have, if I wanted a 13 year old, I would have just started playing a 13 year old. Uh, maybe I like the look of the 12 year old versus the 13 year old or whatever. And so um, I just, I thought it was kind of wimpy on the progression. Um, the mechanics um, it got an eight out of 10 uh, ease of, of learning. I thought it was very easy to learn, especially for a new person like me. You simply roll uh, six sided dice uh, most of the time. One six is enough for success. And so you roll, roll your handful of dice and it's easily easy to tell you how many dice you roll. And you just see a six and you're like, Hey, yeah, I won. Right. And so that's very easy to me. And I like that. Now the originality and cool factor I thought was a nine because, um, I really liked the way that the luck balanced out the additional, at, um, attribute points that other, you know, older characters get to use, you know, luck allows you to, um, to re-roll all of your dice where an additional attribute point gives you one extra dice. It gives you one extra dice to roll like every roll, but I think having, getting to re-roll, you know, a few times per game uh, might come in better in the long run. And so it kind of gives uh, some incentive for playing a younger character instead of an older character, which I thought was a nice little twist there. Now in the depth, uh, I kind of dinged it a little bit there too because uh, of the um, of the mechanics. Because just like kids on bikes, um, there's no hit points in the game. Okay, uh, you succeed a roll, you defeat the monster, and to me that just seems like it's not finished. Um, maybe they did that for simplicity, um, you know, because hit point systems kind of need more intricacy, and it just uh, it would make it too complicated maybe for for the market they were looking for. But just for me, I would like to see some, uh, you know, hit point or fighting mechanics that aren't just you roll your D6 and if you get one six, you're a success. Or if it's typically hard monster or a really hard monster, you have to roll two sixes for success. That really, to me, doesn't tell the story about what's happening when I'm fighting this, this character, this creature or whatever. Uh, so I did ding it there. Now, narrative, I did give it a nine out of ten. I thought it was was great. Okay. Uh, they give you the three standalone mysteries to play. Then they give you the grand finale mystery to play after all, uh, all three of those are done. So that's four total mysteries. Uh, they also give you guidelines on how to play this um, uh, sandbox mode, this um, mystery landscape mode, where you can explore all types of different locations without a script. And so I thought that was really cool. And they actually give you the mini mysteries inside there too, uh, to help guide you. So it's not just like, hey, go do whatever you want. There's some cool stuff in there. So what's up, Michael? So um, I thought that was neat. Now, um, the content, artwork, and layout to me just were killer. I mean, tens all the way around for me. I really enjoyed reading the book. Um, the content made sense, made sense to me where it was located in the book. Made sense to me. I didn't have to flip back and forth a bunch of times. And everything just seemed to be in the right place, okay? Uh, you know, the layout to me was, was fantastic. Uh, the margins and the fonts uh, made it really easy to read. Uh, it wasn't distracting in any way, shape, or form. And the artwork by uh, Simon Stallenhag, is his name, is nothing short of amazing. Uh, each piece, like I said before, tells its own story, 
and it's just awesome. And so tens, tens all the way around on content, artwork, and layout. So this gives the, the overall score for the game a solid eight out of five, uh, 8.5 out of 10 for me. And for a $45 book, for a hard copy, hardcover book, um, you know, 45 bucks for this hard hardcover book, 191 pages, it's just a great value. It comes down to uh, about 24 cents per page of a hardcover book. And to me, that is fantastic, especially with the content that you get. So yeah, that's about it for me uh, tonight and uh, for this week, I guess. Next week, Scott did give me this today to check out. And I'm kind of excited. This is a Tales from the Loop. I guess it's like a companion guide or, or it says Our Friends, the Machines and Other Mysteries. I haven't cracked it open yet. I've just flipped through it. And I guess this has a little bit more mysteries in, in there and then some some robots and machines and stuff like that that you might encounter. And so I'm going to flip through it. And if I can um, give some information about the book without giving away too much, then I will do a stream on Monday uh, concerning this book. And um, yeah, that's about it. Um, anybody have any questions? Be sure to just ask them right here in the chat. Or if you're going to ask them later, if you're watching this later, go ahead and Throw them in the comments, and I'll be sure to get there below, uh, get there later, and answer those those uh, those comments as well. All right, everybody, that's it for me tonight. I hope you enjoy this week of uh, Tales from the Loop with uh, Logician Tim. I think I've I've put on the, the little banner Logician Tim Explores, and um, I kind of like that. Is that what I put up there? Let's check it. Logician Tim Examines is what I have up there, and I kind of like that. That I'm I'm examining this book. I'm not doing a review per se. I'm kind of doing a deep dive and just kind of giving my opinions on what I see from a new perspective. So that's it for me tonight. Uh, wish you all a great weekend and uh, we'll see you um, either tomorrow or on Monday.